Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that is teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Caitlin Kalinowski, and she is the director of hardware for Facebook's AR and VR division. And she's also a guest lecturer at Stanford. Uh, being in such a technical role, I'm really interested to learn how public speaking has benefited her throughout her career. And of course, I'm also interested in any tips that she'd have in getting better at public speaking. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Caitlin. Neil, thanks so much for having me today. Glad to be here. You got it. So from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that you got your degree in mechanical engineering. What was the motivation to get that degree? I just always loved taking things apart. Um, took me a little while to start putting them back together, but even as a little kid, I liked inventing things and coming up with ideas. And so, um, you know, when I was probably 14, maybe a freshman in high school, I found the Stanford Bulletin. And uh, it's just, you know, a bulletin of all the different degrees you can get. And uh, I found actually a degree called product design, which is a mix of mechanical engineering, psychology, and studio art. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to do product design, product development. And uh, later in my career at Stanford, I just switched to an ME degree just because everybody knows what that is. <laughs> you know, I think it's really cool that when you were younger, you were taking things together to develop that kind of interest in, which eventually we would become mechanical engineering. When I was a kid, I took nothing apart. <laughs> I don't think my parents would have appreciated it that much if they came home and the toaster wasn't the way they left it. <laughs> it's not a very popular um, initial uh, set of phases for us. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, for sure. I guess, and also, both my parents like their bread toasted, so that was, just wasn't an option. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 so eventually you graduate, and now it's time to, to get a job and enter the world of work. Was working what you expected it to be? It was, but only because when I was in school, I had internships. And that's kind of what kept me focused, actually, is my internships gave me a really good idea of how business and engineering worked in the world. And that was even more motivating to me than my degree. I actually don't think, at least in the world of consumer electronics, it's something that you can really learn in school. You can learn the basics, you can learn the math, the trig. Uh, certainly you can learn how to think in school, but um, it's a trade. And so I kind of started learning the trade of product design when I was 19 or 20 in my first internships. And so I was really way more excited about that than I was my classes for the most part. Yeah, for sure. And now that you've been working for quite some time, what steps have you taken to build the career that you want? And what challenges have you come across the, that have hurt, I guess, come in the way of that? Yeah, for sure. So I got some really good advice early in my career uh, from a friend who basically told me that as long as you are, have a lot of momentum and that you're shooting for a difficult goal, um, that your career would flow. Basically what I mean is if you kind of overshoot in your career and you have a, a lofty, complicated or difficult long-term goal for your career, yeah, you may change your mind in a year or a month or five years, but it's that kind of upwards to the right momentum that is really important um, in STEM. And so I kind of took that advice to heart and I kept staying as technical as I possibly could, but moving up and to the right on, on my sort of goals really aggressively. So I had very aggressive goals about um, how I wanted to progress leveling in terms of leveling in my career. I had very aggressive goals in terms of what products I wanted to work on and what leadership positions I, I wanted to have. And yeah, absolutely. I actually never expected to be at the level I'm at now at a director level at a big tech company. I didn't, I don't know, it wasn't in my realm of possibility, but because I kind of laid the groundwork, it was something that was achievable for me. So that's one big thing, but absolutely it's not a straight line from point A to B. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, perturbations in the, in the field from, from one place to the other. And when I actually started at Apple, that was one of the most challenging times in my career because there were two teams I was working in, one team that had a culture that was really good for me and one team that had a culture that was really hard for me. And at one point in my first year at Apple, I had to 
say, wait a minute, like, why am I not being successful here? Like, what am I doing wrong? I was probably about 24, 25. And so I started to have to, in this, in this team I was struggling with, look at what people were doing that was making them successful and try to model that behavior. And it took about a year for me to figure out what was making them successful and what I could do. And, and honestly, by trying to, you know, fit in that way early in my career, that was really effective for me in that team. And it was much more natural in the first team. And, um, and that's one of the biggest, you know, challenges I faced, I think, early in my career where um, I think you have to be very adaptable to the team that you're in and the personalities in it. And I had to learn that. Oh, you know, maybe a, a month or so ago, I made a post on LinkedIn asking people about culture in companies and is it preferable to, for there to be one overarching culture or just a bunch of them all under the, you know, the same company? At least it sounds like where you were, there were at least more than one culture at the company. Was, like, was that, I guess, was that preferable to you or, or are you of the mind that there should be one culture and, and that's it, everyone follows that culture? Yeah, I kind of have a specific answer to this actually, Neil. I think it matters even more if you're an underrepresented minority in tech, actually, this answer. But it's relevant to everybody. But it matters more for those of us who are underrepresented, which is culture. Uh, there's two things that are really, really important in order to be successful. One is uh, you have to be able to work within the culture that you're in. And I think every company, whether intentional or not, does have an overarching culture. But any big company has a lot of different cultures inside. And some are more like the overarching culture than others, for sure. But one thing I learned was that whether I was successful or not was partly dependent on that subculture of the team I was on. So when I started doing interviews at other places, I started being, that started being one of my top things that I looked for. Is this a culture I can be successful in? Because as an engineer, if you have the same skill set and you're in a culture that empowers you and a culture that disempowers you, you're gonna reach really different things, really different goals. I think that's even more true if you're an underrepresented minority in STEM. Personally, that's my, my experience. And um, so I think that's one, one piece that's really important. The other piece that's really important is being willing to modify and adapt what you do based on the culture that you find. And so you, you got to figure out what you're willing to, to make concessions on. For me, at the time when I was at Apple, getting the experience I needed to get was so valuable to me that I was willing to adapt to that culture that was harder for me to work in. And it was a trade-off I made very consciously that I wouldn't make now in my career. But what it allowed me to do is this, those <clears throat> a few years at Apple, out of the six years I was at Apple, I was in, in that culture. And it was worth it because it got me to where I wanted to go. But my eyes were wide open about it. And I was like, okay, this isn't exactly the perfect culture for me in this particular sub part of the company, but the experience is so valuable that I'm willing to kind of put my head down, adapt and change how I operate to be successful. Later on in my career, mid-career, I would say, it was way more important to find a culture that matched mine. I could take what I learned at Apple and apply it to Facebook. Facebook, as an example, you know, I told you it took about a year to figure out Apple's culture. And, and these are the top 1% companies in the world. They're great companies, they're just different. But Facebook's culture was just a better match for me. And it took me a week to figure it out. And I, you know, it's a very social culture, as you can imagine. And so I was able to be very empowered and have been very empowered for the last, I guess, seven and a half years by that culture. Yeah, culture is an interesting thing. I mean, just, yeah. just, you, just like you said, the, uh, one company, the culture didn't match you, and, and another one, it did. It's not as if the, the first company is any worse than the second one. It's just that we're all, what we gravitate to is different. So it's not as if Alpha had to change its culture to suit you because it suited, I'm sure, you know, hundreds yeah. of thousands of people that work at, at Apple. And then you went somewhere else where the culture suited you really well and there was no need, there was no need to change anything because it suits you. And if it doesn't suit somebody else, well, mm -hmm. I guess you, got, you must perhaps find someplace else to go where, it, you're, where the culture does suit you. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and even at, at Apple, there was a culture within the company that did suit me, which was this woman, Kate, that I worked for. Her, her team culture was awesome and really empowering. And so, you know, it's important when you're looking at big companies to, to really pay attention when you have a hiring manager, in particular that relationship with your hiring manager, but also the team you're going to be working with to meet them and get a vibe and trust your gut. For sure. So I know you had mentioned that, you know, going on, moving on in your career, you, you were overshooting to make sure that you were 
ending up somewhere where you actually wanted to be career-wise. So are you a, a manager of people currently? I have a team of about 130 people recursively. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, a lot of, that's a lot of people. Was, was being a manager of people something that you aspired to or is that something you kind of fell into? No, it's really funny, Neil. I never, I was very um, focused on the, what we call the IC or the individual contributor track, which is really a technical track where you don't manage people. Um, and at different companies, it's important to note, sometimes you can continue progressing up that chain and sometimes you can't, depending on how the company values that chain. Um, and so coming into Facebook seven and a half years ago, I was an individual contributor, technical person leading programs. But then uh, Facebook acquired Oculus. And when Facebook acquired Oculus, they asked me to manage a small team. And I ended up being managing four managers. So I'd never managed before. And so I'm managing four managers. And luckily, an another thing about Facebook's culture that empowered me, they got me an executive coach. They got me a bunch of training. They got me a bunch of classes. And by the end of that first year, I was what I would say like a passable manager of managers. Um, and I think that that was a big turning point in my career because I'd never done it. I got offered to do it and I had to kind of take a leap of faith and say, I'm going to, I'm going to learn as fast as I can. And it, luckily it worked out. And now I manage directors essentially that have their own organizations. Oh, wow. So from the training and coaching that you received, what, did you, what did you learn that you didn't know already about managing people? Well, the first thing you're going to laugh, because every manager knows that this is true, but those of us who didn't manage before didn't know it was true. Not all of us. You can't actually just tell people to do things, like, if you're their <laughs> manager. Like, that doesn't really work. Like, part of being a manager is aligning people's goals to your own and the company's goals. And I just, I guess, I mean, it makes sense now, but at the time I kind of thought that that was how you did management. You kind of asked people to do things and they did them. And really more, uh, it's more of, of an empowerment and a service job, at least the way that I like to do it, which is turning everything on its head actually, from what I thought. Um, to be, in my mind, a really good manager, your job is to first get to know your people so well because every single person is very different often and they need different things and they have different communication styles and all of that. So even they might use different communication channels, you know, like I would text somebody that I had as an employee because he didn't check his email that much, you know, whatever it takes, you, you need to adapt to. So that's one thing that I learned. Um, another thing that I learned is that, you know, your job is to empower and to break down roadblocks to those people that you support. And so my language around it changed. You know, I talk about myself as supporting a team of 130 people. That's the job. Like you could say I lead or I'm the boss. It's not, it's just not really as effective as saying, hey, we have a goal as a team and I support the whole team in making those things happen. And it really is something that I learned, I would say in the first year or so, by the end of the first year, I was like, oh, I'm just looking at this entirely wrong. And I think, it was a very, very valuable learning for me and very humbling also. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. It is kind of weird when you, I guess, you get put into that position. The things that you that seem obvious weren't obvious at first. You know, yeah, you don't, you don't tell people what to do. It's like when you were an individual contributor, did you like being told what to do? But then you become a manager and it's like, I'm going to tell people what to do. That, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about, you know, managing to the way people want to be managed. I actually was just thinking about this maybe a few weeks ago, too, about just leadership styles in general and how people often talk about, you know, what's your leadership style? Well, isn't it isn't your leadership style based on the people that you're actually leading? So you're going to lead, you know, this person differently than, you know, this other person because they, they want to be led differently. I don't know, I'm not too sure if people actually think about that. They're thinking more of how am I going to do it? And you're going to have to adapt to me, but good luck with that. Good luck with that. <laughs> you know, the truth is, I think about three quarters of managers do that. But my goal was always to not only be one of those top 10% of managers that really change people's life trajectory when I can in a positive way, but also to teach other managers how to do what I learned to do. And so I think the key for me in that first year of training that Facebook gave me is that I not only learned how to do things as a first level manager, but I learned concepts and framework, frameworks that I could then apply at every successive level of leadership that still hold and that still work. And that, that was a value of that training. Yeah, for sure. 
So at least for myself, when I first started working, I didn't see the benefit of public speaking as an engineer. I just did my work, submitted it. And if you had questions, I'd answer them and I'd go home and then come back and do the same thing pretty much the next day. It's only until I became a project lead and had to give presentations in front of people that I then start seeing the benefit of it. Because I really sucked at it at first. <laughs> I didn't want to look like a fool every time I had to give presentations in front of people. So, you know, I, I, got, I, got, I tried to get good at it as quickly as I possibly could. Is public speaking something that you had to improve on over time or did you already see the, the benefit of it even when you started working? Yeah, so great question. So about four or five years ago, um, I looked at what, I, what skills I had and what skills the executives that I sort of was looking up to had. And there were three, three areas that I felt like there was a gap. One of them was written communication, like writing something to say your team. One of them was public speaking. And the other was like more tactical stuff that I won't get into. So public speaking is something that as an executive, you have to be able to do. You have to be able to, at the drop of a hat, get in front of your team and communicate with them. Written communication also. And so what I realized is that um, a lot of these executives that I admired were good at this, were very good at this. And I didn't have a lot of experience doing it. So I started, you know, with small groups, my own team, which at the time was, you know, five or six people in my staff meeting or, um, you know, 30 people in my, uh, in my all hands, for example. And then I slowly started taking some of the things that I was talking about and finding different audiences, like a group of interns or um, people we were onboarding into the company at the time, those groups were a lot smaller than they are now at Facebook. And, um, and so I started to broaden out. And then uh, in 2017, something really interesting happened, Neil, where I wrote an article. So this was the writing side. So I was very consciously working on all of this stuff. But on the writing side, I wrote an article in something called the first round review. And um, it was about turbocharging product development. It was about how to develop products. And instead of talking about, um, it was basically my tactics and strategies for building great products that I had distilled from Facebook and Apple. And it ended up being a successful article. And what I realized is I could take this, it was a long form article, it was like 12 pages. I realized I could take the concepts in the article and turn them into a series of talks, which is what I did. And so as I started to give these talks, I started to give them externally, groups of 12 or 30 or whatever, whoever I could kind of find. And you know, over the next year, my audiences grew. And my last audience was 17,000 people that year in Silicon Slopes. And so over that year, I probably spoke to 50,000 people live, but I gave almost exactly the same content, just repackaged a little every time in what I learned. And I really highly recommend this because what, what happened is I got to know my content so well because I was giving it over and over again to different audiences that I started to work on different parts of my communication. I started to work on stage presence. I started to work on breathing. I started working on slowing down my speech when I wanted you to pay attention or speeding up my speech, which helps people follow you better actually. And I started to work on all these things in addition to the content. And as engineers, I think we're just so focused on our content that we think that we, if we read our content, then that's giving a presentation. But <laughs> look, it's not true. 80% of human communication is body language, 80%. And as engineers, like, that's just so hard for us, I think. It was hard for me, but it's true. And so learning how to communicate your ideas, you know, is, is a huge deal. And especially if you have a technical mind um, and you're more sequential like I am. So that year gave me the training that I needed to kind of now feel more comfortable. But I always get anxious and nervous when I'm giving a talk. I got anxious and nervous before even this talk. And I think that what you learn is not that you're not supposed to get anxious, that's normal. It's that you learn what your body's gonna do and how you're gonna respond to it. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna have sweaty palms. Oh, here they are. You know, you can kind of understand what's coming and then do it anyway, which is my advice. You really were nervous before speaking with me? Well, yeah, anytime I get in front of a camera or like, yeah. I don't, you know, yeah, for sure. Every, yeah. every time I give a talk, I get a little nervous. Oh, wow, interesting. All right, I didn't know I had that effect on people. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Oh, well, okay. Good to know. So, so 
No, so you're 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 giving. So obviously, you got better over time because if you're you're talking in front of seventeen thousand people. I mean, you're, you're that's a lot different, or it's a lot again quite different than talking in front of five. So just that progression was pretty impressive. Is that is is talking as part of your job something that you? I guess are, are are happy to do, or is it something that's just well? I guess it's just part of the job, and I guess I have, to, I have to kind of grin and bear it. I like an audience, which is why COVID's so hard for me. Actually, I like the energy that I get from an audience. Um, I can be extroverted in that way, and I love it. I love that feeling, uh, even though right before I get on stage, I'm nervous. When I'm on stage, I really like it. And so I had an opportunity. I don't know, three weeks ago. As, as you guys might know, we just announced in, that we're shipping the Oculus Quest 2, which I know we're not gonna talk about today, but this is it. And so it's a big time for us. So right before we announced it, I got a chance to talk to the whole Facebook Reality Labs division, which is what ARVR is called now. And uh, it was really fun, but man, it is tough to talk to a computer. And I'm st I still have a hard time because you know, it could be you, Neil, or it could be 30,000 people and it wouldn't feel any different talking to a computer, right? If you can't see your audience. And so that's that's been tough for me this year. Yeah, yeah, I think that's been something that a lot of us have had to kind of get used to, especially, you know, doing kind of virtual meeting. You're not really seeing people's reactions a lot of the times because they don't have their cameras on. So you're just kind of hoping that people are, are taking in what you're, what you're saying because you know, usually when you're at least speak in front of people you can see their reactions so you kind of know if you, if you have them or if you've lost them but yeah it's, it's definitely something all, all of us are kind of having to get used to in terms of the goals that you're that you're setting for yourself now what are what are some of the ones that you're shooting for currently yeah um currently my goals are to start to broaden my base my comfort zone, my base when it comes to engineering. So my history, my background is almost all in hardware, which is cool, which is great. But I'd like to start to understand more about firmware, more about software, more about product management. Um, and I'm getting a lot of experience on the business side now of how to budget for and grow a team, uh, a much larger team. You know, you know, it's great to have whatever, I'm making up a number, $50 million budget a year. That's really cool. But that doesn't really drive me. That doesn't really get me excited at looking at spreadsheets of dollars or even a headcount. What's more interesting to me is product. And so I think what, what my next goal is, is to, instead of looking at product um, really focused on the hardware, I'd like to start broadening my base around product at, at a higher level. And it's really cool. I have a board seat and in the board seat, one of my obligations is to understand you know, the product development process and the future products on the roadmap. And it's been really interesting to, uh, to start to have a broader sense of product from that role. And so that's been a really valuable uh, thing that I actually did in the last year is, is a board seat gives you a really high tops down view of a company. And you're not no longer in the mix kind of affecting smaller details. You're very high, high up. And that perspective has been really valuable for me. Wonderful. Being a leader, I guess the sense I have of leadership is people will come to you expecting or hoping that you have answers. And, and because you just noted that your one of your goals is to broaden your, your experience and other aspects of the company, do you have any issues with asking for that type of assistance to get that knowledge since typically you're the person that people come to to ask for knowledge? You know, it's funny at my level, Neil, I, I actually am almost always the person with the least amount of detailed knowledge about things at this point. Like my whole job is asking people about things and their opinions because I've got to have experts and my, my, my peers have experts on their teams whose full-time job is trying to figure out a feature on a device or architecting that device. And like, that's all their time's focused on that. And I only have a little tiny sliver of, of my pizza that I can spend on it. So actually you have to get humble pretty fast. Like you, you can't do a job like this without asking people their opinions and their advice and their technical, you know, intuition kind of all the time, like all through every day. 
And that's, that's actually my job. So no, I don't, at first I thought that being a manager meant you had the answers, but luckily it doesn't. <laughs> it just means you have to kind of fig be able to figure out who does and connect people who need to be talking and stuff like that. So luckily, uh, luckily I don't need to have all the answers or else we'd be in, in trouble. <laughs> well, that's good to know that you at least have the, the, the self-awareness to know that. You mentioned that you, you often get nervous before you give presentations. How do you deal with your nerves? Yeah, so this is a great question, Neil. Um, what I have found is that there's three or four things that happen when I get really nervous. Um, and they're just like physical things like clammy palms and then this. But the cool thing is, and the bigger the audience, the worse it gets usually, or the, the higher the stakes, the worse it gets. But I know what it's going to be now. So I can just plan for it. And so there's a couple things that I've found. One is that, um, like I need to do like jumping jacks at like about 10 minutes before I go on to like get rid of some of my nervous energy, you know? And then um, I need to, when I first hit the stage, I need to take a deep breath and smile and connect with my audience instead of just like diving right into my content, which we tend to do, especially engineers um, or anybody who's really nervous. And then I need to pace myself with my content. The more nervous you are, usually the faster you go. People just don't absorb things that you say when you're going a mile, a hundred miles an hour. So you really got to feel the stage under your feet and establish yourself as present in the moment and breathe and remember that your audience will wait for you. It's your audience. It's your content and it's your stage at that moment. So if you need to take a second and take a deep breath, they'll wait for you. And when you're nervous, you often think, oh, I got to go right now. No, you can, you can be human up there. I really like your tip about jumping jacks. It's just any <laughs> kind of physical activity. I'm a big fan of that too. I don't necessarily do jumping jacks, but before I, I give presentations, I tend to walk around. So that, that yeah. helps with me. That helps me with dissipating my nervous energy. And yeah, I'm a big fan of, of doing that. So kudos for you for that. When it comes to your presentations, do you have a process that you use to put them together? And if so, what is it? Yeah, it's funny. One of my rules in this article I wrote was start with the hardest part first. And this is a rule that I use when we're creating products. It's like, what's not, maybe not possible. You should probably start looking at that before you start, you know, polishing the chrome on the Titanic, so to speak. And so what I find is that's a really good piece of advice for presentations too. Figuring out what the core message you want to communicate to your audience is before you start making slides. Um, so what I tend to do um, is this: if it's a if it's a typical regular presentation, I'll just write. Um, I'll write a lot out at pages, and then figure out what the core things I want to say. Somewhere in those pages, usually is like, oh, this is what I think is what I want to say, and then I start to edit those pages down and um, write out what I want to say. And it doesn't have to be, it depends on how formal it is. In the most formal case, you, I actually write out the whole speech. And I'm very lucky, a good friend of mine, Jen, is a speech writer. And so I've been working with her. I worked with her for most of 2017, not only a speech writer, but also a, uh, a public speaking coach. And so she is exceptionally good at, we'll have an interview together. And she can actually do that for me. Now that she knows my voice, she can actually write it all out. So if it's a really important talk, um, where I have a budget for a speechwriter, then that's what I do. If it's not, I do, try to do it myself. And then, if, so, so in the most important case, in the most involved case, I have a highly written out now script of what I want to say. And then I start thinking about what visuals make sense. And I try to do, uh, I try to undershoot. I try to not have a lot of uh, words on my slides and I try to have more visuals. And then I start to try to place the slides in the text where I want them to be. And then at that point, and that's just a sketch of what the slide's going to be. And at that point, I switch over to Keynote, usually, and I paste the text in the notes sections of each slide. So I just have a skeleton now. And now I start working my slides. And then after I get kind of the slides in where I want them to be, I start to edit down the pros in the notes to bullets. And that's all practice. So you actually have to read it through multiple times and see what words you want. And at the end of the day, I have like a, it's not even like a bullet points. It's shorter than that. It's like keywords and things that I want to say. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's something that I could look over in two seconds and be like, oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about, you know? And then, so at the end of the day, I have a, f a document that is, I have a full, a fully written out document if my comms department needs it, just to know exactly what I want to say. And then I have a slide deck where all the, all the edits are happening. And then uh, again, if it's a really important presentation, um, my communications department at Facebook will edit the slide deck and make it much prettier than I could ever make it. Um, that's very rare. I only have one of those a year or something like that, that are that well staffed, that, are, that I have that much help. Most of these I'm, I'm doing on my own. You know, I'm a big fan of what you said about the slides having more visuals than text, because when you do that, you eliminate the option of people in the audience reading your slides. They either have to just look at the pictures and listen to what you have to say or tune you out. You, you eliminate that, you eliminated the, the option of them just reading your slides and trying to listen or reading your slides and tuning you out. So <laughs> I think it's, it's smart that you, you focus more on visuals than on text. I, I, I tend to do the same thing. This has been really interesting talking to you, Caitlin. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about things you're working on? No, I mean, if you haven't heard about the Quest 2 yet, I'd love for people to check it out. We're really, really proud of it. And um, yeah, Neil, thanks so much for having me on. This has been really fun. Wonderful. How can people get in touch with you? Oh, I have a website, which is my name, CaitlinKalinowski.com. And um, you can go check that out and see some of the stuff I was talking about. But you can also, uh, there's a contact form. If you want to reach out to me, you can reach out there. Wonderful. Everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course, and it's called Teach the Geek to Speak. You can learn more about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that is teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Caitlin. Bye, Neil.